Hi there, and thank you for tuning in. I'm sitting here next to a map of the world, and that's because I got an email from Argentina, would you believe? And just to illustrate, you have little Denmark up here, and uh, big Argentina is down here. I hope you can see that. A very, very large country, uh, relative to Denmark, that is. And uh, the email is from Frederico, and he writes to me, I shot some pictures last weekend in a place called Sierra de la Ventana, with my manual lenses mounted, and when I downloaded them from the card, I found that many of them were out of focus. If you could make a video showing some tips to improve this, I would really appreciate it. Hope you're fine in Denmark, and that you are welcome to Argentina. I think it's really great fun that uh, when you're this far apart that YouTube actually could bring you together, right? Federico also writes me that he has an Icon D700, so I will take that camera and we will go outside and see if we can shoot some pictures with manual focus and I will tell you what I know about manual focus and maybe that will help Federico and everybody else listening into this video. You can see the sun hits the wall just behind me, so I think it would be a, go a good day for a shoot, so let's head out. I guess the first good question is why would you shoot in manual mode? And to me there are several answers. One is that some of the old vintage lenses, really good lenses that you could get for a bargain, uh, they only come with manual focus, AI and AIS lenses. And the second thing is that manual focus gives you some insight to photography that you would not get if you only shoot with auto mode. Um, it's just like if you have a pocket calculator and you can use it. If you can calculate manually without the, the calculator, then you get a better insight to what uh, the pocket calculator does. And it's a little bit the same with shooting manual. You learn a little bit about photography every time you shoot in manual mode, as far as I see it. Then there is the question of when to use manual focus. And for me, I only use it for stable subjects. I have a feeling that Frederico, he doesn't write it in his mail, I have a feeling he only uses it for landscapes. So that will also be my recommendation. Only stable subjects, little birds and birds in flight. Maybe you can hear them, they're just above my head. I would never ever uh, use manual focus for that. For that I will be highly dependent on the autofocus system of the camera. So one really important thing is the focal plane when you're shooting manually. There's only one focal plane. No matter how advanced your focus system is or your camera in general, there's only one focal plane. And sometimes when we see cameras that can focus on you can identify several faces and the eyes of a pet or whatever. We may think that, wow, it can focus several different places. It can only put the focal plane one in one position. I think of the focal plane as an umbrella. If you imagine a big, big umbrella that you then tilt 90 degrees. And then as you turn the focus ring, you can push that umbrella back and forth. And where the fabric of the umbrella touches, whatever that touches, that's in focus. I'm not sure if that picture works for everyone, but that's what I keep in my head when I think about what's happening as I'm zooming in and I'm sorry, as I'm focusing uh, at different distances, I'm pushing an umbrella and uh, only where the umbrella is do I have the focus, the image in focus. Another thing to be aware of is what is called depth of field. And this is what I call forgiveness just around where your focal plane is. So if your focal plane is here where my hand is, a little bit before that and a little bit after that, there is, your image will appear to be in focus in that distance, in that space. So much or a large depth of field, of course, give you a lot of forgiveness if you have a nailed focus exactly spot on. Now, I'm sure you're aware that Depth of field is a function of your aperture. So if you close down your aperture, you get a very large de depth of field. If you open it up and shoot very, very wide, then you get a very shallow or thin depth of field, right? There is another factor, and that's the distance to your subject. So all things being equal, 
the closer you are to your subject. Let me just show you this tree here. The closer you are to your subject, the more narrow your depth of field will be, even though you're at the same aperture. And that's because the depth of field is relative to the distance to the subject. So the closer you get, the less depth of field you have, the less forgiveness you have if you miss focus. So micro photographers, they struggle with this on a daily basis because if you're photographing a little beetle or whatever, and you're extremely close to that, then of course, this distance to be a subject is very, very small. And of course, even though you're shooting at f32 or whatever you are, that doesn't really help you because the, the distance to your subject trumps the aperture. So be aware of both the aperture and the distance to your subject. Make sure to have a bit of both. And that means um, you, can, you can try this out, but I would say be careful if you're shooting landscapes, shooting too wide, meaning uh, say f1.8 or thereabout, that, that's way too open. Also be careful going too narrow because then you get diffraction, that's another issue. Um, so, so stay in the middle of the road. Everything in photography is a compromise. So I would say f8, f11, values like that, they are good for, for landscape photography. But be sure you also think about uh, the distance to your subject. Don't get too close, otherwise you will get in trouble, potentially. Another thing to get used to when shooting manual is which way to turn the focus throw. And there was someone on YouTube, a comment to a video of mine that I'm very grateful. Unfortunately, I can't remember who it was, but I'm very grateful for whoever told me that. But he said, imagine there's a little football sitting on top of your focus throw. And then the focus system, you know, these two arrows, that you have these two arrows that either point left or right, and then you have a, a dot in the middle. And when the dot is activated, then you have focus. And if one of these two arrows is, is pointing, then it's telling you, you need to adjust your focus. But these arrows, if, if you stand as a photographer and you imagine there's a football on top of your camera, what are, whatever way the arrow is pointing in your viewfinder, you need to turn the football exactly in that direction. So if I just go, do like this, if the arrow is pointing to the right, you need to get the focus throw and turn it towards the right. And of course the opposite, if it's pointing to the left. So a little uh, reminder, that's very, very useful um, when you wanna figure out how to obtain focus. So remember this little football on top of your focus throw. So first of all, if you want to shoot manual, uh, a good thing is to check if your camera, typically on a Nikon here, the D700, has a little button here that you can turn and you can take it into manual mode. This lens is an, I think it's an AIS lens, an 85mm, a very good lens, just metal and glass, but there's no autofocus in this one. But if you want to make sure that you are not causing any troubles for your camera, put it in manual mode. What that does is it sort of uh, disengages the autofocus motor so you're not uh, you're not driving the motor when you are you're changing the focus so make sure to take your your camera in manual mode that's a good practice when you're when you're shooting with manual focus another wonderful thing about these old lenses is that they have uh, both a distance scale and also they have a depth of field indicator and this is super useful um, in terms of understanding how you spend your depth of field. It is so that if you look at the, the scale here, this one starts at 85 centimeters here, and then you turn and you turn, and then you're at, let's say, three and a half meters, and then you turn a little bit more, then you're at eight meters, and then you turn a little bit more, then you're at 10 meters, and boom, all of a sudden, you're at infinity. So the, when, when, you, when you look at how much you turn the focus throw, and the distance is like a hockey stick, Nothing happens here in the beginning. You're, you're at 85 centimeters and then you're one meter, two meter, three meter, 10 meter, and boom, the distance is all of a sudden goes to infinity. And what you want to make sure, this is the hyperfocal distance, but I think it's a very complicated term, but just make sure that if you have a lens with these uh, depth of field indicators, it's, it's like two markers of paint uh, that shows you from where to, uh, 
uh, where the, the focus, where the depth of field starts and stops. Make sure that you optimize that so that you make the best of use of it. If you focus to infinity, you're actually wasting uh, a good deal of your depth of field. So pull the focus a little bit back from infinity, then you get more into focus. This is, of course, provided that you don't want to go into more advanced things like uh, focus stacking, which I think is a subject for, for another video. But, but if you just want to make one landscape shot, make sure that you optimize your depth of field so that uh, you get the most bang for the buck in terms of uh, what is in focus. Because not everything in one shot can be in focus. It can only be within this interval, the depth of field. Okay, so I just interrupt myself here because I'm not sure how well I explained that out in the woods here. So here to the left, shooting at f16, you can see when you put the aperture ring at f16, you have to look for the pink color here because now you have the pink color next to the, the black dot here. And that means that these two markers here now show you your depth of field and the white big marker here shows you where your focal plane is. So in this case, I have focused around, you can see it between 10 and 20 meters, so it's 16 meters out, I would guess. And then I have depth of field from infinity and down to, I would say a little bit more than seven, maybe eight meters. On the other hand, if I'm here to the right shooting at F8, then it's the green color I have to look for. And you can see it's still the white dot that indicates, of course, the focal plane. But now you can see my far depth of field is put to infinity, but where I pay the price is in the near depth of field because I don't have so much depth of field now. So I'm paying the price and you can see instead of having maybe from eight meters and out being sharp, now I'm at perhaps 16 meters and out. So that's how I can use the depth of field scale. If you don't have a depth of field scale on your lens, you can use a depth of field calculator. I'm using the one from Photopills. You can see that down here. So credit to them for, for this. This is just a snapshot I did. You can see I set it to 85 millimeters. That was my lens, aperture f16 and so on. You can see now it actually reaches the same result. Uh, the only thing that is a little bit strange, I think, is for these depth of field calculators is you need to know your subject distance. I mean, where you put your focal plane. You can see I've estimated that it's around 16 meters because it sits between 10 and 20. It sits a little bit above uh, the middle. So 16 meters I've estimated. And that gives me, according to the calculator, uh, near limit is roughly 8 meters. Far limit is infinity. And that's also what you see here. Near limit, a little bit more than 7 perhaps eight and far to infinity. So that's how you can see it. If you don't have uh, this depth of field scale, then you can use the calculator. But the downside of this is you need to know how far away you're focusing, where you put your focal plane. Okay, let's get back to the guy in the woods. In my experience, when I come home with images out of focus, it's seldom the gear that is an issue. But I will show you here a little test you can do if you have an idea that your gear is not you know, giving you the right information. So I will, I, will, I will do two things. I will shoot the same image, same distance, same aperture, everything. But I will shoot that in two different ways. One, where I use the, the focus system, you know, these little arrows that I talked about previously. And then another where I use live view to go in and uh, zoom in. Because you can, the wonderful thing about live view is that you can turn your rare LCD into a electronic viewfinder. And that gives you here on the Nikon D700, you can just zoom in by pressing this button. I think it is. That was the minus button I hit. But anyway, it's the plus button down here. When you zoom in here, you get an sort of, of course, an electronic uh, magnification. But it's really great if you want to zoom in on a very, very small thing and make sure exactly that thing is in focus. And once you got that, you can take the shot and then you can compare the two shots, see if the one taken with the focus system differs from the one you're taking in live view. And thereby you can have an idea about whether your focus system is a little bit off. I must say, again, my experience is the problem is often behind the camera and not inside the camera. But let's get cracking. There you are. I can see I can see the branches was waving a little bit. So I may get some 
some shake because it was shooting on one thirtieth of a second. But that's because I'm shooting with a very a narrow aperture, which gives me a lot of depth of field. I could also try and change that to, say, f8, and see what that gives me. That's, that gives me one, 125. On most cameras down here somewhere, you have a live view button, but in the case of the Nikon D700, it's a little bit quirky because this was one of the first implementations that Nikon did. So you have to find live view on the dial up here. And uh, second thing is then you have to actually push the shutter to get it into live view mode. And now the, you can see here, the camera shows you what the sensor receives. So you now have an electronic viewfinder available. So now I push and you can see I can get really, really close. Yeah, and then I can turn the focus ring. You can see this clearly is out of focus. Yeah, this is definitely sharp. I can see some spider web there. So round about here, it's sharp. So let me take a shot. Then it moved out of live view, so I take a second shot. Now I want to change the aperture to f16 just to get exactly the same image. I zoom in again. And I think focus is round about there. You can see there's something moving because of the wind, so with this shutter speed it will probably be a bit shaken, but that's okay. Boom, there it is. So now I have two shots, actually I have four shots, two different apertures, and uh, let's go home and see what we can learn and if there are differences between these two. So here in Lightroom, to the left the one shot with the focus confirmation dot, and to the right the one shot with live view. And if I zoom in here, as I expected, I think it was around about here, I focused and you can see that they look very, very similar here at 300%. And this is also in line with my expectations because the depth of field is very, very large when you're shooting at such a narrow aperture and also you have good distance to the subject, then whether you focus, you know, on this branch, on that branch, or maybe the stem here, I don't think you will ever notice the difference. So here we get the same result. When you shoot at such an error aperture, you can see even though it was a sunny day and even though I shot at ISO 800, uh, I'm at 1 30th of a second. And that introduces other factors that could be seen as uh, out of focus. Let me just show you here, because I think I also mentioned that when I did the shot, that it was a, a windy day. And uh, you can see here, what here, to, especially to the left, looks like out of focus is actually the subject moving while the shutter is open. 1 30th of a second is relatively slow when you have branches moving in the wind. And uh, this is also what you see here. So be careful with your, your shutter speed. Make sure that it's fast enough so you don't get any subject move while the shutter is open. Another factor, of course, is camera shake. And uh, I shot this on a tripod, so I should be good. But also be careful with not going too slow with your shutter. If you're not shooting on a tripod, there could also be a source of images that look like they're out of focus, but actually it's camera shake. If I take the two other pictures, now we are at F8, and you can see the shutter speed is now a bit better. Still the ISO 800, but we are at 1 25th of a second and exactly the same because still with good distance to the subject and F8, there's a lot of forgiveness in terms of the depth of field. So if I didn't focus exactly on the same point or if the focus system is a little bit off, then I don't think you will ever notice. So if you want to find out if your camera has a focus issue, maybe the best to do is to shoot very close to your subject and at a very wide aperture. And you can see this is what I've done here. I shot this at 85 centimeters at F2, and this gives me a depth of field of just one centimeter. Yes, you heard right, one centimeter. And again, I have the focus confirmation 
dot to the left and I have the live view to the right. And here I will actually say, if I go to maybe even to 400, here I will say I can see a difference. The one here to the right with live view to me looks a little bit sharper or maybe the contrast is better here. Sometimes I have difficulties distinguishing between better contrast and better sharpness, but I would expect that in this case, as it's exactly the same image and position and everything, and these images are shot with 14 seconds difference, right? I would expect that it would be a difference in sharpness or focus. And you can also hear the lines here in the green, they're missing over here. So definitely there is a difference here. And I think actually I got a, a sharper image of the flower here in the foreground with the live view than what you do with the focus confirmation dot. So this tells me that this combination of lens and camera gives different results when I use the focus confirmation dot or the focus system of the camera. And if I use live view, before I let you go, I just want to show you one more thing. So here I have a book by the Danish photographer, Per Bak Jensen, and he's one of my favorite photographers. And it's called something like the voice of the eye. That's how we translate that or stem in Danish. And uh, if I just open very carefully to this page, I think this is an amazing image for many reasons, but I just, when I study the grass in the foreground here, it's sharp. When I study the stem, it's sharp. The trees here in the middle ground, sharp and far, far away, sharp as well. So how has he done this? So the only way I can figure out how to do this image would be to actually be quite far away also from this stem and then maybe uh, either you know zoom in or crop so that uh, you have everything in the frame is actually far away if that makes sense it's a little bit counterintuitive to, that you need to go away or move away from the stem here in the foreground in order to get it sharp but that's the only way you can get it into your depth of field because as you know you need to spend the depth of field from infinity and backwards and uh, if you have something then that's very close to you it becomes difficult but if you manage somehow to get also what's in the foreground pushed a little bit away from you then you are able to get everything sharp and in focus and that's basically what i think he has done i don't know haven't talked to him but for sure impressive that you with one shot can get an image like this. So Frederico, this is what I had prepared for you. I'm sorry the video was so long, but we have covered a lot of ground and hopefully some of it was new to you, some of it you could use. And uh, if you wanna see more videos about the D700 and live view, if you wanna dive more into that, I have a dedicated video for that. I'll see if I can figure out how to post a link to that in the top of the screen here. As always, Happy shooting. Take care. Bye-bye.